Hey, everybody, what's up? All right, so I'm just going to come out and say it. Is it time to start looking at ditching React? And I created a video a couple of years ago on this subject, and yeah, granted, I was sort of ranting, and the reason why I was pissed off is because I had to rewrite a project that we had just finished because some hipsters wanted to use hooks, even though they told uh, told everybody in like the main documentation, okay, you're using a class-based system. You don't have to go full you know, functional with hooks using like the set state and use effect and all that, or use state, use effect. Um, but my days of react, they, they go back a long way. So like, I'm not trying to like actually crap on react. I, I've made a lot of money doing react development. I'm pretty good at it. I've been around since the beginning of react. I think my videos even reflect that. Um, I was around when we were using JSX transpiler, which was included as a script tag. And granted that was for development. It was like this humongous, um, you know, script file that would actually run your code all like a uh, client side and transpile kind of on the fly. Um, you wouldn't use that in prod, but anyway, it was pre Babel days. So we're, you know, before Babel in, in involved itself in like the JSX transpilation. I remember the days when React was still actually documenting how you could do things in actual JavaScript and avoid writing JSX because a lot of people really hated JSX because it combined your HTML, CSS, JavaScript all into one. And it just seemed like, um, you know, like a completely new thing to learn. So a lot of people threw it away and including like fun, fun function. I remember I watched a video of his and I agreed with him 100% because I went down the same path. I actually picked it up three times and it was on that third time the JSX started like making sense to me. And like, you know, I'm like, oh, I can, you know, I like this. I can get on board with React's component-based architecture. The unidirectional data flow was a lot easier to understand than the uh, bidirectional data flow that, that something like Angular was using at the time. Uh, I would say the component system, the component life cycle, all that really made sense, especially if you had ever done any sort of Android development uh, or hell, even C Sharp, you know, web, web forms and stuff with different uh, life cycles. Uh, so I, I was there during the whole class-based system of React. I then saw it move to the functional components and bring in React hooks. I remember when they were documenting everything and like it almost seemed like you could manage state, you know, based on the component architecture, one component encapsulating another. I was there through higher order components, you know, wrappers. I was there when Flux came out and then Redux, and I was involved in production websites using both of those. So all this said, I know a lot about React, and I'm not saying that like, oh, we ditch it right now, but hear me out on this. We now, like React is coming up on its 10 year anniversary. So it's been around for 10 years. It's been popular for almost that entire time. And it was really because JavaScript was such a disaster with like all the frameworks that we had coming out after jQuery. jQuery really solidified the entire JavaScript market. And then I would say to date, uh, React is the closest thing that we've ever had to a jQuery replacement. And jQuery has been dead for, you know, near the entire time that, uh, well, really not the entire time, but I would say jQuery has been pretty much dead since about 2016, probably a little earlier. So with React, um, this is an example of like, if you want to get started with Redux, right? They got this uh, Redux. And why do we even need Redux? It's because React's state management is not all that good. Um, each component can manage its own state. However, when components have to update their parent state and such, uh, they're typically subscribing to functions that are passed down, st state functions. We're still doing that to some degree. Um, but solidifying everything into a global state, whether or not that's even a good, good, good idea or not, um, typically it, it really just depends on what you're trying to build. I would say for the more advanced complex applications, then yes, it, it's necessary. But for most everyday mom and pop shops, it's absolutely not. So Redux actually comes out because Flux was created by Facebook in order to sort of like um, centralize how a global React application could manage its state so that every little component, whether it's nested like way deep down into the DOM, which it's not even a DOM, it's a virtual DOM. However, it's another point I'm about to make here. Uh, but it didn't matter where these components were nested. This sort of gave a um, purely functional way of maintaining your state so you didn't have any sort of side effects. However, sometimes there's side effects in applications when you're making AJAX calls, things are based on times. You got bugs, runtime, servers are down, whatever. There's going to be side effects. And then we had to introduce things like thunks, right? Thunks are any sort of delayed processes. So you have to bring in Redux thunk and you're like, well, why the hell isn't this, you know, in here by default? Now we have Redux toolkit, which has that built in. So for all these beginner developers that are like jumping into this, it's like, oh yeah, you know, I can master React. It'll take me like five years and React's here to stay. But my, my thing here that my main point 
these libraries, they come and go. I've seen them come and go. My first language was Perl. That came out at a time when they did regular expressions better. There was a lot of websites running on Perl. Amazon was running on Perl, or at least a lot of its you know, back, back end processes were, were relying on Perl. Where is Perl today? It's gone. Uh, web forms is something that was the first like production level uh, where I got paid as a software engineer to write web components. The same thing that we're doing with Material UI, I was doing back in like the early 2010s. And I was doing it on a legacy stack at the time, which was web forms, but I was writing components that were reusable. Now, granted, they were server side and they weren't like client side code written in TypeScript or JavaScript and bundled all together through a bunch of build tools like Webpack, but they still, the concept was the same. In fact, the search engine optimization for those old ass systems are probably still better than what we have today. Even if Google says that they know how to read JavaScript web based websites better, they really don't. So one of the biggest selling points of React is that it's supposed to be reusable. You have like a component based system. We used to have the component lifecycle. Now everything is functional with hooks. And this even still shows the class-based documentation, which like nobody's using. So I don't even know why they're doc, you know, they document this in this way. Uh, nobody's really using classes with React from what I've seen, everybody's going functional. These little counters, like it seems like we used to think these things are so cool. You could write this in Java, you could write a little JavaScript that counts like literally in 15 minutes, even if you don't even know what you're doing, you could find the code on the web. You could, you could write something like this. So it's almost funny. It's like, oh, this is something you know, spectacular, but really it's just the component manages its own state and, you know, similar to what you could do in the regular DOM. Oh, a binding text box that is printing out to another div element as you type. That's something you could easily do with an on-change handler in a regular JavaScript uh, DOM. Another big selling point with React is that it is considered to be just a view library, meaning that it only handles web components, UI, and it doesn't involve itself in like uh, routing and things like that, that Angular tries to force on you. But the issue is, is like pretty much every React application out there is going to use those things. Everybody's like building single page apps, hitting microservices via Ajax calls, and the single page app needs to have routing. So what ends up happening is you end up bringing in a ton of libraries in order to handle that. Something like React Router DOM is a popular project for React routing. Um, so these different routes are how you hit the page. And then you have to deal with like, oh, I got to deal with all the headaches of how we're actually taking away the browser's basic navigational functionality. And you have to do a bunch of, uh, you know, hacks and stuff like that, especially when you're dealing with something like Webpack Dev Server. You have to learn all this stuff. You, you learn it on, you know, and, and the point being is like, there's got to be a better way, right? Um, maybe. This might be the best way. This is probably the best thing that we have so far. And I admit that. But what I'm trying to say mostly is that things do die. React is now 10 years old. Do we think it's gonna be around for another 10 years where all the new devs coming out of college, everybody's gonna to wanna to write what everybody else is writing? One of the things that always happens in programming, and it happens for a multi multitude of reasons, people go with the next flavor of the week thing. Uh, but one of the reasons why React is so popular is because once something gets popular, like jQuery or whatever, you can save a lot of money as a business by going with that technology because it's a much easier to find people that know how to do it. How many programmers are using Haskell and then how many programmers out there know React, right? It's much easier to find a React programmer than Haskell or OCaml or even C, uh, C or Pat, uh, Cobalt. I used to have a neighbor that had a $2.4 million house and he was a Cobalt contractor uh, because nobody knew how to, to write it anymore. At least, I mean, he was like one of the Cobalt cowboys or whatever. But um, anyway, the point being is like, Companies don't want to deal with a situation. We have, we have the Social Security Administration in the United States government that is still running Fortran code from like the 50s and 60s. And <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, try to find some of those developers. That's going to cost a lot of money. So just because something is widely adopted or somebody says that something is the greatest thing that they've ever seen, a lot of people do that when they don't really have, I think, full experience in the business world and IT in general. So you can be really good at React. And I consider myself to be pretty good at it. It's not like I want it to go away because, you know, that's what I do. And, uh, but I think that things do go away. Like th our new programmer is going to want to write what programmers were, were writing 10 years ago. You could look at something like C, which is being replaced by like Go and, uh, and hell, even C++ and, and, and Rust. And 
Um, you know, there's still C programmers, but there's not, there's not as many. SQL is probably a good example of a language that was written in the 70s that's still like widely used. Um, but, you know, there's still all kinds of tools that are built on top of SQL, right? Object relational mappers that prevent you from having to write that raw SQL. New things will come along and whether or not they're better, uh, and, you know, and, and a lot of things that are popular now, it's not just necessarily because they're better. It's because there's a wide adoption and business, especially in IT, is all about wide adoption. Where I see React sort of going astray, it's changed its architecture and the way that we write React. It looks night and day different from what we were doing with React when it first came out. So React today is nothing like what it, what it was when it came out. A lot of those changes were because of lack of insight. There were adaptions that were made because of inefficiencies with the framework, and that's bound and necessary to happen. So who is to say in five years from now, something better is not going to come along. I actually happen to think that it will, but it hasn't happened yet. So wh what is that? It's web components, really. Like if we're looking at an alternative to something like React, what would be better? We need something closer in my mind to like jQuery. Like jQuery used to be, okay, I included the jQuery library, which you know shouldn't be necessary, but it was because the DOM just couldn't really work with modern day JavaScript all that well, even like, you know, query selectors and all that didn't work very well. They've made major headway though over the years. Uh, web components though, they provide the same component type architecture, but instead of using React's virtual DOM, and for those that don't know, React is virtually constructing all of your HTML, all of your HTML elements. It's all constructed via a JavaScript library, which is React, and the components exist in memory. So you're doing all that stuff based on the way that React tells you to do it. Basically, five people at, Re at Facebook who originally developed this project set this in, in motion. Now, there's been thousands of contributors along the way to React. However, like the original core code was like five dudes. That said, like why do we want to do that? When and, and why will that be the future? Even if it's widely adopted now, why would that be the future? when the browser is supposed to handle the DOM. So that's where web components come in. This is where it natively runs in the DOM. Now it doesn't have a fleshed out full component lifecycle or state management, but there's a lot of other projects that you can tap into in order to use web components. Web components use the native DOM, so whether it's a mobile browser or whatever, you don't have to load anything in memory. The browser just simply handles it. You get encapsulation via the shadow DOM, so for like scoping your CSS where we're using component CSS all over the place. It does it natively through the shadow DOM. Now, why hasn't this taken off? I don't really know. Um, it's mostly because there just isn't enough of an adoption. I feel like there's not enough awareness, but we will eventually be there. I do think that if I had to bet five years from now, React is gonna be on its way out just because it naturally sunsets like every other piece of software uh, that we've seen before it. And React's changed its direction so many times that I can't even count at this point. So eventually people are going to get, you know, pissed off. I'm like, yeah, hey, fuck it. You know, I'm going to go with something else. You know, I'm going to go with something else. And eventually people will jump ship or herd animals as coders. And we sort of follow whatever's popular. So these days, I mean, we have lit. This is a project that was by Google. You can see this is all native stuff. So you're writing actual components in JavaScript or TypeScript, but it runs natively in, in the app. It doesn't need a library in order to render it. Then you have uh, Material UI. So uh, MUI is very popular, and that's um, really you know using React. And it's um, you know it, it's good. It provides a lot of uh, code reuse and all that. But the same you know component architecture is available with actual native web components. So that is a library that's out there and uh, who knows if this will gain traction, but these are all buttons that don't need React in order to render them. The browser does it by itself using, like I said, web components, shadow DOM and all that. And then you have the fast framework. So it's not like user interfaces only exist because of React. We had them a long time before React. We're gonna have them a long time after. My question in this video, at what point do developers jump ship? It's about to be 10 years that we've been using React, and I would say about eight very popular. Uh, eight years it's been very popular. So how much longer does it have? I'm curious to hear what you have to say. 
If you're learning to code, I recommend you check out my website, CodeHawk.com. My courses are fast, to the point, without the fluff that you'll find on other competitor sites like Pluralsight and Udemy. One of the reasons why you'll want to learn with me is that I'm a self-taught engineer myself. I never went to school for any of this stuff. I've been doing it for over a decade now, professionally. The biggest reason you should use CodeHawk is that it's one price for everything. I try to make this as affordable as possible. Instead of having to purchase 15 to 20 different courses on Udemy or an expensive monthly subscription to Pluralsight, it's one price for everything on CodeHawk. Front end, back end, full stack. It has courses on all the latest web development technology. The courses range from beginner to advanced. So if you want to learn the latest web technology, give CodeHawk a look. There's demos for all of the courses that are out there right now. Uh, in addition, there's also my personal vlogs, which I'll be adding more to. So content that I don't release to YouTube is available on CodeHawk.